how difficult had the, the last few months been for you guys trying to just figure everything out? Yeah, I mean, it's, listen, it's been a crazy, you know, I don't know how long it's been, eight or nine weeks since we really dove into this. I guess the one advantage or disadvantage we had is in late January, late January, we were dealing with COVID when I think most Americans weren't exactly sure what it was, but we had an event in Thailand, Singapore, and China. So we were kind of the first, I think, in sports to be canceling events as it relates to COVID. But I find it's, uh, it falls on deaf ears if I tell you how difficult my life has been, because I don't know anybody who isn't going through a really difficult life right now. And the fact that we can't play sports is really problematic in my world, but may not be, uh, may not make the top 10 of world priority issues right now. For sure. Um, I saw yesterday you talked about, it may end it was yesterday, um, the financial reality of what you guys are going through. Um, what exactly is the financial reality that the LPGA has faced? Because you've worked so hard to build this thing up. Um, and I, I think you said something like that might all be gone with this. Is that, is that true? Yeah, what I said is, you know, we've, we've saved more money in the last 10 years than we saved in the 60 years of the organization before that. And it was a, it was a talking point of mine. I used to say to the board with pride, despite all this growth, the most important thing is look what we're saving for a rainy day. I didn't expect it to be raining this soon or this hard when I was making those comments. But um, yeah, I said, it's, it's not inconceivable that we don't play in 2020, heaven forbid, we could wipe out 10 years of savings and 10 months of of not playing. Wouldn't wipe out our savings in general, but it would certainly erase the greatest growth period in LPGA history pretty quickly. I think the good news I tell people all the time is, you know, the LPGA has been around for 70 years and, you know, no COVID and no home quarantine and no interruption of schedule is going to keep us from being around the next 70. But it is tough, like anybody else's business. I mean, I'm, I'm making cuts I never expected to make when we started the season. I'm, I'm looking at a business forecast that has, that looks nothing like what it looked like in February 1st of 2020. And um, unfortunately, that makes me probably just about like every other CEO in the world. Because you have such a diverse and global tour, how much more difficult does that make this to get everything restarted? Yeah, you know, um, I have said many times our greatest competitive advantage in sports is that we're global. We come from all over the world. We have fans and sponsors all over the world. And I have made this comment in interviews like this a hundred times, which is, you know, we can live through a, um, a recession in a certain part of the world and it doesn't cripple us. You know, if you go back to 2008, 2009, a U.S. recession really halted the LPGA. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen recessions in different parts of the world that you may have not even reported on, but I've watched us go through. But because our revenues are so diverse, we're, we're really kind of pretty sound. And I think a lot of other sports, when I talk to other commissioners, it's the thing I think people most respect about what we've built. But I didn't envision ever a global recession, you know, where you actually talking about recessions in all markets at all time. You know, should that become a reality? Um, it's a really difficult challenge for us. I think to your specific point, um, you know, a travel ban here or there, of course, you figure it out and you get through. Travel bans in virtually every country are really troublesome. 35% of my tour right now between players and caddies are not sitting in the U.S. In fact, when, when stay-at-homes were becoming a reality, I really encourage players and caddies go home, wherever home is. Because, you know, in these kind of tough times, sitting in your condo in Orlando or Texas when your family's somewhere else probably wasn't the best advice. So I just suggest that people go home. Now we got to get everybody back. And we got to be able, you know, even with the rest of our schedule in 2020 that we're pretty proud of, we're still in nine states and I think eight different countries. So, um, you know, we're just not a stay in one place kind of tour. So it, it's got a series of challenges that come with it. So once again, one of our greatest competitive assets will probably be one of the biggest obstacles we'll have to deal with, at least for the rest of 2020. In um, talking with Judd yesterday, he basically said that it just doesn't, their business model just doesn't work not having fans, uh, having spectators inside um, at the Marathon Classic. How much have you left that up to individual tournaments? And how, are you letting them make that decision about, you know, whether or not fans would be allowed and if we'll even have a tournament if fans aren't allowed? Yeah, what I've essentially said with each tournament, and Judd's a good example, is let's not make any decisions based on what April 30th is telling us. Because if you make business decisions on April 30th, you just crawl into a shell because it doesn't, we're not quite in the daylight again. Um, so I said, you know, I asked every tournament, how late can you make a final go, no go decision and a final decision about size of footprint of fans and TV and everything else? In Judd's case, he's about 40 days out. You know, so Judd and I agreed, let's make the decisions in 40 days out exactly what 
the Marathon Classic looks like, feels like, how do we manage the pro-am, player dining? We've got different scenarios that, you know, he knows that we've run by all our tournaments in terms of how we can do this. To your specific question, I will never tell a title sponsor who's writing the check, this is how we're going to play your event. That's a great way to win in 20 and lose the rest of your life as a tour. And I've said this to our players many times, I'll make 20 as good as I can make it, but only as good as I can make it by respecting long-term the people that have written checks for us over the years. So if Judd and Marathon and Dana and the rest come to me and say, Mike, this is how the tournament's got to be, and we just don't think we can do it this year. We're gonna, we'll play it. We'll play it next year. We'll play it later in the year. I don't. Um, I won't dictate to them how to do it. They know that we have a plan for how we could go in a really small fan or no fan footprint. But at the end of the day, each tournament. I said this on an interview yesterday. Don't expect the one size fits all at the LPGA. Each one of my tournaments, each one of my sponsors feels differently about them their ability and their desire to put on different events. We're going to make sure that we can deliver the event that they want. And if we can't deliver the event that they want, we'll be realistic with both them and us and make other decisions about later dates. I only have a couple more for you. Um, I was talking to Judd yesterday about the safety and, and the plan that you guys have once everybody gets here. And he talked about having every player tested when they step on the grounds and then potentially again, even after they make the cut. What are some of the things that you guys have, have thought about and, and plan on implementing once this does get going? Yeah, virus testing will be a, will be a new normal in, on LPJ life if you're a player, caddy, staff member, volunteer. Um, you know, we want to make sure that you're safe and we want to make sure that we're safe when we roll into a town, right? Because we're going to come in from all over the world. I wouldn't want anybody sitting in Toledo or Slovenia to say, well, I'm uncomfortable with the LPJ. So one of the things I'm going to deliver is the safest group that comes in. Um, we're really lucky. Some of our sponsors, I'll give you a good example, Jordan. One of our sponsors is NEC. And NEC, just today, literally this morning, installed in our headquarters a uh, facial recognition scan. So, to, you know, tomorrow when I go into the office, if I was allowed, first thing I'd have to do at the front door is it would scan my face. It would take my temperature. And if it recognized me and if it, my temperature was normal, I enter the building. If not, the building door doesn't open. Um, that's the kind of technology we're working on our headquarters now because we're taking that into the market with us. For the, uh, for the Symmetra Tour, the LPGA, and the Ladies European Tour. So every player, every caddy, every staff member will be facially scanned every day. We'll know the temperatures of everybody when they walk in. We have the same apparatus available for us to even as fans walk in. It's not individual facial scanning, but we'll know if somebody's walking in who has a fever. They may not know, but we will, and we'll help point that out to them. Um, so little things like that. On top of that, like, as you can probably guess, I mean, um, as it relates to virus testing, like I said, that will be a regular part of our life and not just a Monday test, but we'll be testing pretty regularly on tour and in every market we go in because we do want to make sure for, for my own sanity of my athletes and my caddies and my staff, I want to make sure they're comfortable. And for anybody else in any market we're going into, I want to make sure that we're not doing anything to erase all the hard work that millions of people have done for the flattening of this curve. We, we don't have the desire nor the right to mess up what millions of people have done. So we're going to make sure that we're the safest group we can possibly be. Um, you have been part of the president's advisory group. What has that experience been like for you? I'm sure that was never something that you kind of anticipated uh, sitting in on conference calls or whatever with the president and all the commissioners from the major sports. Yeah, it's been interesting. Not only am I on the sports commission, but some of the CEOs of our title sponsors are on some of their individual business commissions. So it's funny. And I was, I was on the sports commission one day. The next day I was talking to the CEO of Dow. And he would have to run because he was hopping on his commission. So the one credit I would give the White House is they really are involving us in the, you know, in the rebirth, if you will, or the, or the opening of America. I would tell you the best thing that's come out of that is it's really pulled us together as a sporting entity. Getting to sit on a call and listening to what the NHL is thinking or what Major League Baseball or Major League Soccer or, 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 or MMA, all of those folks are having the same meetings I'm having in their own on their own Zoom conference calls. Um, but we've never really, uh, we aren't really sharing as much. By bringing us together, we created this incredibly quick collaboration where I've learned about um, test sourcing options that I didn't know before I got on that call. They've learned about facial scanning that they may have not known before they got on the call. So I think coming out of that, we've always been pretty good in call. Jay Monahan, myself, Mike Davis from the USDA, Keith Pelley from the European Tour, we're talking every couple of three days anyway. And, COVID's only made that more regular. But um, I would tell you that other than once or twice a year, I'm not really in touch with what the, what the NBA or the WNBA is up to. In this situation, I'm kind of on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, we're really connecting with each other. And I think the, 
the being able to, in, in, in a weird time like this, where there's virtually no playbook, you know, I can't, I can't go back to 1973 and see how the LPGA dealt with the coronavirus. It doesn't exist. So in that time, uh, going through this with somebody else who's asking a lot of the same questions and maybe getting some different answers, it's invaluable. So I, I, would, uh, I would say a virtual high five to the White House for getting, for getting us together and making sure that the collaboration, because at the end of the day, once they got us together, the rest sort of took off on its own. And, and the last thing I want to ask you about here, and I'll let you go, um, that extra money that, that some of your sponsors uh, have put into purses or, and some of your other tour stops, um, how did that come about, A, and, and how important is that for these players to have a little bit more incentive when there are so many events that have, have been canceled or there are other opportunities they won't get this year? Yeah, I mean, I'll answer those in reverse order. I mean, when we started this year, we were going to be over $75 million in purses and greatest purses, greatest TV coverage, greatest viewership levels the LPGA's ever experienced. Like, we were, we were talking about in our 70th year, we were setting every record on every factor. You would, you would assess how good the LPGA is doing. And you wake up four or five months later, and you realize how many of those opportunities left. So to be able to say to the players when they come back, one, if, if we can get started on, in the middle of July and play until December 20th, um, we're going to be nonstop. We have, you know, we have uh, the Masters week off and Thanksgiving week off. Other than that, we're playing. And that's exciting that our sponsors came together, found new dates, and figured out how to build a schedule. And then for the guys who just – we either simply couldn't provide a date or they were in a location and a facility where you can't play in November because of where they want to play their event. I was blown away when some of them said to us, listen, Mike, we were prepared to spend a lot of money, obviously, this year to, spend, to, to do a golf tournament. What if we provided you some of that? even though we can't put on the event we want, and how would you best go about using that? My quick answer was I would try to replace some of the opportunity lost to these athletes who, who don't have contracts, right? They, my athletes aren't sitting on four-year deals and no trade clauses on an option. Here. They only get paid when they play. And I think a lot of sports fans sort of miss how different golf is than what you might be on a team sport or a league. So, so yeah, it's pretty cool. We're going to play for the greatest amount per tournament. Uh, in 2020 than we've ever played for in a year. So in the midst of all this bad news, when we come back and, rest and, and restart in 2020, at least the average purse opportunity per week, um, on average for the season, will be the highest we've ever played for. That's pretty exciting given all the bad news that you have to deal with in a COVID-19 year.